I know you guys are in the chat here, but I did promise I would actually get to one particular comment on my past videos. Um, let me just scroll through and find it that MK posted on one of my videos, a very long comment. And I, and I told you like in the last video, it's like, I'm going to get to this comment because, um, <laughs> Emilius, cheeky, cheeky, cheeky. Oh, yeah, let me find. So MK. <clears throat> If I can find the comment now. You left a long one. I'm gonna get to it. Cause I want you all to like let's have a conversation. You know what I mean? Oh, here it is, a really long one. What video was it? I oh, know wait, this was the eighties video. And then on my a top 10 80s perfumes video, you left a comment. And then another one. Ah, this is the one I wanted to touch base on in particular. On my live stream, uh, the, the Chanel Summer 2021 Pret-a-Porter fashion show. So uh, let's get to it. Um, MK. Hi, Jacob. Very interesting and informative review. Congratulations. I just put your uh, I just put your video because I wanted some company while working out my abs. <laughs> and I got so absorbed by what you said that I stopped completely and just sat watching your video. Honestly, you should seriously be thinking of becoming a teacher in a fashion school. Students will be mesmerized in your class for sure. Thank you, MK. I agree a thousand percent with a lot of things you said. And don't worry, you were clear enough about trying to listen to others in order to open up, to nourish oneself, and therefore to be more articulate. I do also like to discuss with people who are different and think very differently from me. Not to prove them wrong, but it does just really help me to see things with a wider perspective, even if there can be some disagreements in between. Unfortunately, I am afraid to say doing so hasn't been very trendy over the last five years. I mean, what people usually do nowadays consists in avoiding to elaborate their opinions, at least in front of you, too afraid to offend anyone, <clears throat> and making some very generic statements instead. Dare to go to the opposite direction, and they might call you names such as, well, bad names when I can't say on YouTube. We had never lived in such an individualistic and narcissistic time. Sincere compliments aside, there are some points I want to discuss with you. First of all, this logomania trend. You can't expect the fashion house to remain the same as what it was during the era of Gabriel Chanel. I think they, Guy Bourget, Lagerfeld and Via, have done a great job over the last 50 years of constantly rejuvenating the style, yet keeping the fundamentals. As far as I can recall, the brand caught my interest when I was eight years old, back in the late 80s. Chanel has always been known for putting logos everywhere, especially since Karl Lagerfeld took over. Prints, buttons, embroideries. Here we get to the first point, MK. Um, <clears throat> you say logomania trend. You can't expect the fashion house to remain the same to what it was to Gabriel Chanel. I think... Guy Bourget via Lagerfeld have done a great job the last 50 years, yet keeping the fundamentals. As I can recall, the brand caught my interest when I was 8 years old, the 80s. Chanel has always been known for putting logos everywhere, especially since Karl Lagerfeld. No. Chanel has been lo known to put logos everywhere, not especially since, but since Karl Lagerfeld. Coco never put her logo. You, you did not see a double C printed all over her clothes. Never. 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 That is something that the 80s brought with them and Lagerfeld brought with him. And that stuck with the marketing team. They started putting logos everywhere. And now it's gone so far that it's a must. Only, you see, only not couture. They have to, they still stay faithful and true to Coco's aesthetical language. And in the haute couture, they do not, 
put logos anywhere. But the prêt à porter, it, they're not allowed to even create one button without the logo on it. That that's their code. They have to do it now to be recognizable. Because heaven forbid, we're not going to recognize the Chanel brand. I I find that cheap. You know, it's like a must that they impose to themselves. It's not because they want the brand to further develop and become better and evolve. No, it's just so that they can brainwash the customer into justifying an exorbitantly overpriced price tag because you're paying for that logo on that button. You're not paying for the actual quality of the garment. So it's very, very tricky psychological game played there. And Lagerfeld was a master at the Logomania uh, stuff. Chanel wasn't. Well, of course, we did have logos on her cosmetics, but that was, you know, for her buttons had the lion head on them, the camellia sometimes on them. And uh, the double C was a very, very rare thing. And it had a totally different structure, totally different design on clothes than on cosmetics. But during her life, Chanel, she did not do the these, you know, exorbitant printed or knitted logos woven into her garments or whatever. Never. Never. Um, and today they just respond to a demand for logos that is even more massive than what it was before. They are a huge business company and need to sell as much as possible after all. Not some random artists with a message to deliver. Money does make the talking, right? I quote, I've learned from you. Yes. Now, money um, money does do most of the talking. But my question is, does a brand like Chanel that is already earning so much money, do, must they um, behave this way in every instance of their Pret-a-Porter collection? Can't they have a little niche, a little niche, a little segment, just a little sprinkle throughout the collection a few pieces that are more subtle, that are more close to Coco, you know? You you don't need the logo on everything. You want to show off a logo, then, you know, get yourself the bag with the huge double C. And But you don't need the, you don't need the jeans with the printed double C all over them, and then the cardigan with the printed Chanel all over it, and then um, the bracelet with the Chanel, the earring with the double C. Like, it's too much, you know? So what does this, what does this mean? If I want because I love the style, the cut of the clothes. If I want a total Chanel look, and I, I don't have $200,000 for an haute couture total look, right? But I have $50,000 for a prêt-à-porter total look. I do not have the option at Chanel to maybe subtle it down a little bit and not have a logo on every garment that I buy. So if I want a total look at Chanel, I'm going to be logified from head to toe. And this is... This is this is vulgar. Like I get it. Put a logo on one piece if you want. You you know. But allow me also as a customer to within the collection find the pieces where I can also avoid the logo. Now, of course, there are some pieces where you can avoid it. The buttons, that's law. They all have to have the logo on them since several years. So a garment with buttons or a zipper, there's going to be a logo there. But you can still find pieces where the logos are not interwoven in the fabric of the actual garment. The inside, yes, they always have it. The silk linings, they always have the double C's all over them. But that's okay. I mean, it's, it's just on the inside. It's something that you know for yourself. I find that totally fine. But some of the pieces we've seen in the prêt a porter Spring Summer 2021 collection for Chanel, like... But and, and the tie, the aesthetic of those logos, it's so dated. It feels like it's from the year 2002. It looks that way. And and so, you know, it feels heavy because it's it's like not fresh, you know, and because you it's you I'm using your words here, you say they have to evolve. Okay, fine, then evolve with the logos, but then find a new creative way to implement that logo within the garment. Don't give me something that feels like you've recycled an idea because you ran out of ideas. So you took an idea from 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Why? I don't know. Just a thought. Just a thought. Okay. Um, besides, you often go to their boutiques, right? 
just uh, give a look at their customers nowadays. I am not uh, specifically pointing my finger at customers from certain countries, but just also pay attention to their local and Western customers. The other day, I went to Roucambon to pick up an altered P code with a friend who is not into luxury or fashion at all. And he said something like, darn, uh, I would have never thought we are at Chanel now. It feels like being at Foot Locker or Nike store. I feel like doing a sociological study right now. I'm just fascinated by the crowd here. Concerning the work of Virginie Via, I think she's currently leaving her mark. She had been highly criticized because of her shy personality and hence lack of charisma, the, antith the an <laughs> antithesis of Karl Lagerfeld. However, she has already revamped the Maison's codes in a very subtle way. They are now interpreted through the lens of a now middle-aged Parisian woman. You can clearly tell that she is someone who loves movies and music in general. Uh, NDLR before working at Chanel, wasn't she a costume designer in the film industry? Though not being her client, I do respect her work as much as I had worshipped Karl Lagerfeld's achievements. I think it is pointless and irrelevant to compare those two geniuses, works, and to judge who is the best. Now, I never do that. I did not judge. I did not compare them. However, you don't forget, she's not her own person fully and completely. Why do I say this? Because for 30 years, she worked under Carl. She did, she executed what he wanted her to execute. He left her, he left his print on her. It's not like they found, they employed somebody after his passing that's that was external, that can bring in fresh air, their own input onto Chanel. No, they strategically chose to take Virginie Via because she continues the Lagerfeld legacy which I find perfectly fine. I have no problems with it. But we cannot say that uh, she kind of is just a totally different entity. She's been influenced by him for over 30 years. That's a long time to work under somebody. Obviously, it was fine for her because otherwise she would have left. Why stay in a, with a company for so long? She probably loved it. Good for her. But we, we know that if you work under, under somebody for 30 years. The same with art students. You're going to exit art school with an imprint of your art teacher. And usually our teachers are artists themselves. So they give you their... And artists have very strong characters. And their character sticks to you too. So we, we mustn't forget that when, when we analyze Virginie Viard's work. She tries very hard to be herself, and it's, in many respects, very different from Carl. Um, but we still see the homage or homage that she pays to him and how she tries to connect him with Coco and with herself. And she loves her little punk roots, her own, you know, she loves Susie Sue, Susie and the Banshees, you know, all that stuff is, you see it mixed in her collections, and then there's a bit of Carl there, and then there's a bit of Chanel there. So, it's a tricky one. I'm still observing her development. There are some pieces that she made that I love, and the pieces that she made that I love, those are the pieces that look closest to what Coco would have done. The other stuff, I'm not a big fan of. However, she has already revamped the Maison's codes in a very subtle way. They are now interpreted through the lens of a now middle-aged Parisian woman. You can clearly tell that she is someone who loves movies and music in general. <clears throat> I think it is pointless and irrelevant to compare those two geniuses' works and to judge who is the best. It is a kind of like comparing what John Galliano and Raph Simmons, basically apples and oranges, did at Dior. Again, we can't compare the two. You can't compare Virginie Lagerfeld with uh, Galliano Raff because Raff Simmons did not work under John Galliano. Raff Simmons did not work for Galliano. Galliano did not influence Raff Simmons for 30 years as his boss, which is what happened between Carl and Virginie. 
so we can't come of course you're right we cannot but we we um you can't compare uh carl virginie with the duality carl virginie cannot be compared with the duality galliano raff it, it can't um True, the accessories are less playful nowadays than what it used to be. I'm also a brooch collector, and I haven't acquired anything new since autumn winter 2019. However, I was personally moved by this collection and the marketing. Fantastic preview clip around it. By the way, the show wasn't supposed to be uh, a homage to Hollywood at all, but to the golden age of French cinematographic art, 60s and 70s, and its timeless icons such as Romy Schneider, Jean Moreau, Catherine Deneuve, Anna Karina, Jean-Paul Belmondo, Alain Delon, Jane Birkin. That's why we can see Paris in the background behind Chanel Hills. Even the last cruise collection was highly inspired by classic movies from that era, such as La Piscine or Le Prince. I know all these movies, by the way. I will visit the exhibition on Sunday 18th, the exhibition on Chanel that's open now in Paris. Can't wait. Oh, Sunday 18th. So that's tomorrow you're going to go to the show. Can't wait to complete my education there. P.S. Nice look, a modern hybrid between Hammer Studios, Vampires, Aleta, and Werewolf. Thank you. But this was for the last video. But okay, so this is for the live stream video where I had another hair. Listen. So yes, of course. But again, it's the aesthetic they're using. We can't compare it to Hollywood. Then don't do the Hollywood aesthetic. Don't do the Hollywood logo. Turn it into Chanel. I'm very well aware. Uh, I think, MK, you maybe missed the pre-show of my live stream because what I did post on YouTube is my review of the show from the moment the show started. But I almost, the video that is almost an hour long before the show started, that part is not on YouTube anymore. Um, so I did mention all of these uh, movies and I mentioned uh, European cinema more than, um, so what I mentioned was <clears throat> Coco Chanel herself. You see, this is the thing. If you're gonna make a show and your whole invitation card is about teasing us that it's about Hollywood. Because at the end of the day, Coco Hills, fine. That's the Hollywood logo. So if you're going to tell, if you're going to connect into my brain, a person like me who has so many books on Chanel and who loves her and who knows her history, if you're going to invite me with a logo, the Chanel Hollywood logo, um, of course, the first thing I'm going to think about is, oh, wow, we're going to have a show that's connected to when Coco Chanel in the early 30s was invited to MGM Studios by Metro Golden Meyer and made for a couple of movies the costumes. So we're going to have that 30s vibe going on. But that wasn't the case. So you say, but it's more uh, oriented towards these other movies. And then I tell you, be careful there, because again, there's, Chanel did not, yes, individually, Chanel herself did dress, Romy Schneider wore a lot of Chanel's dresses, in fact, one of my favorite short um, stories with Romy Schneider was Luchino Visconti's Boccaccio uh, 70, Romy Schneider was only wearing Chanel in the whole episode, uh, but uh, in the La, La Piscina, I don't think that she was wearing Chanel Anna Karina, would, uh, she did wear in Godard's movie Chanel, but not always. Catherine Deneuve also. Catherine Deneuve is more <clears throat> famous for wearing Yves Saint Laurent and, of course, for her Chanel Number no. 5 advertisement. But you say it was more an homage to these movies, French and European movies from the 50s, 60s. And then I, I also tell you there, yeah, fine. Okay, let's go there. But then, if we're going to rein it into European cinema, then why not reference the most important movie? Maybe I'm crazy, but to me, the most important movie that Chanel ever made, costume-wise, was uh, last, um, uh, last year at Marienbad. And that's a European production. It's a European movie. That mood, that style that dreaminess that almost nightmare of not understanding are we in the past are we in the present it's so avant-garde that movie no reference to it whatsoever nothing instead we got this kind of light-hearted 
weird patchy mix of colors and combinations of clothes and shapes that as separates i totally like some of the pieces but the way they were combined mo for the most part it felt dated not in a good way not like 60s reference cinema 50s 60s 70s it felt more like dated like oh this is from the year 2002 and this is something I have an issue with because, again, don't get me wrong. I don't think this has anything to do with Virginie Via. I think this is marketing. Marketing decides how they want to market a product. So she designs or co-designs a collection or part of the collection, and then they do the rest of kind of packaging it, creating the package. And the package is messy. It's messy because they're delivering so many different levels and they're packing so much into it, you know chanel is about minimalism always has been coco always said you know what take off more take 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 off take off and what the essence that's left that's the piece and here we have this hollywood but non-hollywood the hollywood logo as a transformed as a chanel logo we're referencing the hollywood logo which is prime time of chanel in Hollywood, which is the 30s, but we're not going to show you anything that references the 30s. So we're going to show more like the 50s, 60s cinema, French cinema, but that's not Hollywood. But we're going to say it's Hollywood. But we're going to do the colors of the dresses that looks a little bit like the early 2000s. But it's not the 2000s because we're referencing those movies like, uh, you know, Romy Schneider is wearing uh, her clothes, uh, like uh, Anna Karina is wearing her clothes. But they weren't always wearing her clothes. And not in, in most of the movies these actresses were acting in, Chanel did not do the costumes for those movies. So what are we referencing here? A certain mood of life but is that a Chanel mood of life is it is that the modern Chanel is the modern Chanel kind of dreaming of referencing something that she never really did the way that it's envisioned by brand marketing as if it were done by Chanel in the past because that's messy that's a messy communication now we're talking about communication here we're not talking about Virginie's designs if we were to strip away the communication, the marketing communication, and we were just to tone it down to the single individual pieces. You could even say, let's tone it down first to the single individual total looks. And then from there, we strip it down further and we analyze single individual separates. Just the jacket, not the jacket, t-shirt, pants, belt, buckle, uh, bracelet and shoes all together. That's a mess. But just separates, just the bracelet just the jacket. Then we see magic. So you also have to understand, Virginie is not the person who actually styles these looks. There's a stylist that's paid to do it. There's a stylist team that's paid to do it. There's the marketing team that's paid to do the marketing. Everything has to be, all these blocks come together and then the final product is shown to, to the audience. And there, I think they're lacking coordination. They're not on the same page. It feels to me like they're not on the same page when it comes to how they communicate this brand, uh, their, this style to, to the world. It's, it's just not. And so that has to change. So my criticism is not to Virginie herself. It's to the entire package. And the entire package, she's still just one wheel in this huge system. And I have the feeling she doesn't have that much of control as Lagerfeld used to have because again she worked under him for 30 years so the whole company is also used to not really taking orders from her so certain decisions are made and are just put onto her i have the feeling still today she does the designing of things but then certain other processes i think are mechanically done already she gets to know about them but i'm not so sure how much input she really gets into saying you know what no don't do it like that do it like this instead I do not know. It doesn't feel to me like she has that input. Maybe I'm totally wrong. I shall stand corrected if I am wrong, and uh, we'll get to see in the next, uh, you know, collections. But you know, you know what I mean. Like that's that's kind of anyway. But I thought your comment was wonderful. Thank you so much for writing, and that's why I dedicated this whole slot to it because I thought it was really important to read it, uh, to read through it together, and. Um, and get to answer it and analyze it together. Uh, this uh, this comment, uh, co comment, this comment. And then while we're at it, um, 
Second comment that uh, also MK, <laughs> this is MK moment. Number two, the top 10 perfumes, the top 10 perfumes from the 80s. My video about the top 10 perfumes from the 80s. It says, um, mesmerizing and regressive video, Jacob. Thank you. <laughs> uh, my top 10 fragrances from the 80s is going to be quite different from yours because I grew up in France and we didn't have Giorgio Beverly Hills, Elizabeth Taylor, Liz Claiborne, and Calvin Klein at the time. Um, all those brands were released in France by 1992-1993 following the 90210 Mania TV show. For those of you who don't know, it's Beverly Hills 90210. Those which are stuck in my subconscious olfactive memory are Poison by Christian Dior, a true masterpiece and the first real olfactive memory of my life. I remember my mom used to put on the body milk called at the time uh, the um, the Marvelous Milk. I actually have it still. I have it in my archives. The original, I have one sealed boxed and then I have also a, an unboxed bottle of it. it smells divine. Uh, every night before going to bed, she would use it. The fragrance of the milk was even more delicious than the actual Esprit de Parfum. I agree. Fiji by Guy Laroche, uh, Mur et Masque by L'Artisan Parfumeur, uh, Fahrenheit by Christian Dior, Lulu by Cacherel. So Coco is the fragrance that ignited my love for Chanel. So actually, we already have three in common from the 80s. So your selection is not quite different than mine, my dear. Ines de la Fressange. Uh, sorry, Coco is the fragrance that ignited my love for Chanel. I was crazy about the TV commercial featuring Ines de la Fressange. As a seven-year-old little boy, I dreamt about the lifestyle depicted in the TV spot. Kenzo, ça sent beau, and Kenzo Homme. Uh, L'eau de Adrienne by Annick Coutal, Paris by Yves Saint Laurent, Jardin de Bagatelle by Guerlain, and Polo for Men by Ralph Lauren. So, Ralph Lauren, so you did one American, you did have one American perfumer there. <laughs> All those fragrances are reminiscent of some friends or family members that are not here anymore. Up to this day, I am still wearing Mur et Musk, and yes, Deco, I do belong to the third uh, estate. I'd rather eat cakes just because having an acidic skin. All flower, resin, musk, and amber apart, wood-based perfumes tend to turn into horse pee <laughs> uh, on me. I do mostly wear citrus or musk-based fragrances. You are right. When I think about 1980s fashion, I mostly think about America. Michael Jackson, Madonna, American Psycho, Dynasty, uh, the movies American Gigolo, Back to the Future, Goonies, Working, Working Girl. I love Working Girl. But American Psycho is not from the 80s, it's from the 2000s. Uh, as a kid, I used to collect miniature perfumes. I think they were my first entry to the luxury world. You are right. Sales associates were not stingy at the time, and I was always I always got gifted mini perfumes that I still own. They are somewhere in my basement, and surprisingly, most of the fragrances haven't deteriorated as years go by. The ingredients must have been much less synthetic at the time, I suppose. Another great comment. Thank you so much. So listen... That's the thing about the 80s, that luxury, that um, being, I don't want to say altruistic, that's the wrong word, but um, generous, just generously lavishing you with samples and uh, gift baskets when you purchase something. And the whole attitude about it was amazing. Amazing. You felt really incredible. That, there you really bought the dream and you got a piece of the pie or a piece of the cake with the dream. Today, we buy the dream. That's all we buy. In the 80s, you did get a slice of cake with the dream. You know what I mean? And that's the difference today. And, and these perfumes, they're, to me, their smell. Every time I smell these 80s masterpieces... It's not just a dream. I get to taste that piece of the cake all over again. And that's amazing about the perfumes of the 80s. And that's what I'm missing in every... I kid you not. That's what I'm missing in every single perfume released today. New perfumes released today. I'm missing that piece of cake. They're expensive. You get them. Some of them smell really good but they're dust, they're a dream, and there's no substantial cake there. Because the whole 
mentality that goes with it has changed. As I said, back then, it would be like the gift basket, the samples, the huge samples, the, the discussion, the talking with, with the sales, the sales associates. They were educated in a different way. They had a passion for the, the way that they would talk about it and the time that would be dedicated to the client. Much different. You know, today it's like spray it, try it, buy it, leave, buy. You didn't even give me a, a little sample. Oh, sample, yeah, what do you want? I got this, 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 or this. Uh, you can choose one. <laughs> you know, I'm like, wow. Wow. That's not, that's not cool. I just spent, this is what they do at uh, Maison Dior. Oh, yes. You go to Maison Dior, you buy uh it doesn't matter. I mean, even a 250 mil huge bottle, they can only give you one tops two of the seven ml, you know, the, the miniatures with purchase. And they tell you, they're even apologetic about it. Like, yeah, sorry, like this is like, that we have to do it like that. That's like how we've been ordered to do it. I'm like, I don't want to know if, if really you're telling, you know, we were talking about this before, like as a client, you're not allowed, to, you're not allowed to, you're not supposed to ask how much something costs, because if you want to know how much it costs, you can't afford it. Well, well, boo, guess what? The same applies to you as the sales associate, not just sales associate, but the same applies to you as a company. If you have to tell me after I made a purchase, if you have to like tell the client after the client has made a purchase, Oh, I'm so sorry. You know, I can only give one sample out. It's the equivalent of you not wanting me to ask how much something costs, because if I ask how much it costs, I can't afford it. If you have to warn me that you can only give me one sample, then maybe you can't afford it. So shit goes two ways, girl. It doesn't go. Uh, uh, no, mm -mm. no. And then what? This example that we were talking about, Trisha's, you know, dropping 40, 50 K for four bags because poor thing, she felt guilty for not asking the price. I'm like, it's crazy. And then what? You get nothing, nothing. I mean, you get the four bags, which are already overpriced. Did they slide in a bottle of perfume as a thank you little gift? So when you come home, you unbox your bags and one of the bags, they hit a perfume and you're surprised. That's the piece of cake, you guys. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. And it used to be that way. I used to come back home after shopping something like that. You know, you get a bag, you come home, and then like in the box is also a little perfume. Yeah, as a thank you, as a little a little gesture, just to say thank you. We appreciate that you're there. That's luxury. You know, that's luxury. That just being noble about it, being like, you know, because at the end of the day, those perfume, they cost them nothing. You guys, nothing. Of course, they cost them something, you know, but they, they don't cost them the $320 that 200 milliliter Les Exclusives bottle of something. That's not the price of that perfume. That perfume doesn't cost them more than 20, 30 bucks tops to, to produce. So it's a small gesture or even a freaking lipstick, something. They always have those for you, but no, you're not allowed. You can't, you're not allowed to do the no, 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 no. So you can't afford to give me a little thank you for spending all that money, but I'm not allowed to even ask how much something costs. No. What world are we living in? What world are we living in? How contorted is that? So don't ever be ashamed to ask whatever you want to ask, whoever you want to ask it. Because as they say, I mean, you know, I'm not, I don't totally agree with the fact that like there are no stupid questions. There are only stupid answers. Some questions can also be stupid. Let's like, let's be honest about this. If we're going to be really like straightforward about it, like some questions are really dumb, but most questions are not. And it's not just about the question. It's about the context. You know, it's about the whole situation. It's not just about the question, the question per se, just like the collection that I was talking about, the Chanel collection with all the pieces. If we see the whole marketing, it's a mess, but individually, if we take separates, then it works. Same with questions. If you take a question outside of a context and just analyze the question per se on its own, no question is stupid. But within a given context, a certain question can be a bit dumb. Just saying. Keeping it real. Let's check the comments. Ah, oh, hi, Lisa. Lisa says, hi, Jacob. Interesting. Um...
A smoking Okie says, MK, your comment is awesome. Johnny says, so awesome. Robert says, so fluent, MK. MK says, that's exactly what I said. It was already full of logos in the 80s. I never said Gabriel Chanel used to put logos everywhere. I agree it's too much of logomania, but when what can you do? That's what their customers want. You see, MK, this is an interesting point because I are we sure that that's what their customers want? Or is that what they taught their customers to want? Manipulation of clients. Manipulation of the consumer. Marketing is a monster. Don't ever forget that, you guys. You'll never know who those idiots are sitting in the marketing team, ploying and plotting against you. You'll never know their names. They're well hidden. So you're going to blame somebody else always, but not the real culprits. You know, they even call, they start manipulating kids. Oh, yes. They educate. There's a word. There's a terrible word for it. I would have to Google it. Um, terminology, this uh, sadistic way that they call, that marketing calls uh, children. They're like, marketing for kids is called training like training to manipulate the consumer of the future. You start manipulating them when they're small. We are the result of that. Because they manipulated us when we were small. So question every thought you make. Every decision you make is probably rooted a couple of decades in the past with the manipulation that began when you were already a kid. It's vicious and cruel and I cannot believe that it that they that governments don't have stronger laws in place to protect consumers from this because this is insane insane American customers love wearing a logo to show look I have money haha -ha. well um, Chinese customers love it even more than Americans at the moment I think Robert says logos suck really. I Robert, you see, this is this is what I'm talking about. Robert, the young generation, born in 2001. This is it. The kids today. Well, there's even younger. There's a generation younger than you too. Like there's like the 14 year olds now, like Greta Thunberg. That's the generation, you guys. That's the young generation now. Now, in another, give it another two years, and she will be surpassed. There's going to be a generation after her still. But this is it. It's the younger generations. They're they're fed up with it. They're done with it. Now, the consumer society and up and coming China with all their money and stuff, like they're still catching up to the rest of the world in terms of logos, and but they'll catch up quick. They're very intelligent people. They learn very quickly. They're gonna catch up to the fact that all of these major European American brands are actually fooling them into taking a lot of their money, but not giving them a lot of quality, but just giving them a logo, making them believe that the logo is what justifies the price, that quality is irrelevant. Not true. Quality is very relevant. Anyway. Um, clothes have to speak for themselves. I agree. I enjoy the Louis Vuitton monogram print very much on a smaller bag. I love the LV monogram too, but we have been already manipulated into loving it. You know what I mean? That's the thing. That's what we don't realize. We recognize the Louis Vuitton logo. I love a good monogram like anybody else. I love a good monogram. I mean, that's actually the only stuff from Louis Vuitton that I buy is the ton sur ton monogram. Love it. I'm a sucker for it. I'm a total victim to it. <laughs> victim. Total victim to it. You know, I've been sensitized to it and and we recognize it and it feels like home because we recognize it. We know what it is so we can associate ourselves with it because we feel like we belong somewhere because what, when we recognize something, it feels safe. And that's what it is. It's repetition, repetition, repetition until it it's imprinted in our minds. Um, yeah, the she, uh, the she, she, I wanted to say Chanel and CC, the she, she all over makes it look so cheap and it looks like it's trying so hard to rub on people's face how much you spend. Yeah. Louis Vuitton logo is even trashier. Emilio says, of course it's trashy. It's totally trashy. But I, um, I love that trash though. It's trashy up to, in, in, <laughs> says the person with, uh, wig made out of scotch tape <laughs> the history of Louis Vuitton is pretty amazing and I like it I like it too a lot of it not all of it but I like a lot of its history 
Misa says, oh my God, the tape hanging from your wig. Yeah, because this is, um, Lisa, because you tuned in late. The, the video began with a segment where I review uh, Comme des Garçons, the tape perfume. Hence, the whole look was made for this review. So the beginning of the video is actually a review of a fragrance. And I'm wearing tape. I made this wig. And it's semi-translucent because of the blue screen. And uh, yeah, and I put tape in it. <laughs> and Mina says, only thing I spend money on is turbulence. The, the fragrance by Louis Vuitton. And Smokey Nookin says, and I dislike Louis Vuitton fragrances. Lol, too funny. Yeah, I don't like their fragrances either. I'm... MK says, of course, Virginie has been influenced by Carl, but she also has her own style and personality. I can see the nuances between her style and Carl's. Just give a look at her haute couture collections. Mm -hmm. Yep. George Andrade, how you doing, sweetie? I'm so late to the party, but yes, let's take off. Hey, sweetie, how's it going? <laughs> Johnny says, Appalance, you get everything. Um, <laughs> Emilio, do you earn everything, Johnny? Oh my God, we cross, we cross thought again. <laughs> the words whisperer. So everything is synthetic now. Some of the ingredients are no longer allowed in the USA as they're difficult to obtain, expensive, and not sus Okay, I lost the comment. <clears throat> they're difficult to obtain, expensive, and not sustainable. Nothing smells as good as those 80s fragrances. Even though those 80s fragrances are also super synthetic. Um... George Andrade says, you better get them together like Velcro. What, the tapes? MK says, the only brand which is still not stingy is Chanel. My essays always give me a whole bag of miniatures, and I don't even like their fragrances. Well, I'm sure, MK, that in the chat there's a bunch of people who would love those little miniatures, so send them over to, to who, who would love them. <laughs> Amelia says, um, no, wait. Diptyque is great about um, slipping in a perfume bottle if you buy a lot, and also complimentary candles. Pity I'm not a fan of Diptyque, so. <laughs> Diptyque and Byredo are pretty much the same brand with different names, uninspiring, and Hella boring. Oh, we cross, we cross that again, Emilia. Oh my God, you guys. Sisters from other misters. Um, Candy Fluff, how you doing, sweetie? Kids can name like 100 logos by the time they are six. My little nephew, who just turned one, already knows how to operate an, uh, an, a smartphone. I mean, that tells you everything. Subliminal messaging, yes, that's a big thing. Uh, no, but seriously, they're owned by the same company. Diptyque and Bayredo are owned by the same company. Both brands use the same ingredients, same everything. Same everything. <laughs> Brandon says, the wig is very comme des garçons too, lol. It is kind of. Oh, <laughs> see me. Asian Delight, are you still going? Girl, I know, we're still here. You were gone for a minute, but you're back now. I see me, welcome back. Yeah, we're still going. You missed a couple of amazing rants. You would have loved them. Jack says, I've not been purchasing anything from any brand whatsoever the past year or so. It's also inhumane and valueless. Slowly becoming a swamp hag. You know what, Jack? And again, Jack, I, I know you also from commenting on, on Instagram and stuff like you look super young. And this is, again, the example that I was also mentioning uh, before uh, when I was talking about Robert and Robert born in 2001, you guys are the young generation. 
And we notice this with every comment. You can see, you can just literally make a social analysis of the comments here, all the young'uns in the comment section. Uh, you don't want the logos anymore. You're not purchasing anymore. Like you're fed up with it. This is the generation um, that is so fascinating to me that uh, the time has come. And again, Greta Thunberg, who's even younger than you guys, they don't care about the logos anymore. They don't care about overconsumption anymore. So all of these brands that are trying to manipulate us, the consumer to consume more and more and more and more, they're going to have it really tough in a couple of years because all of the young kids growing up now, they don't want to be victims to consumer society. And they are not victims to consumer society. America is a different story. America lives, America, America equals consumer society. They're, they, they do not know how to exist without it. That's a different story. But even there, more and more people are waking up to, to the fact that uh, it, it's a mess. You, you can't keep producing garbage, trash, consumption, consumption, consumption. It, it, it can't go on anymore. It's going to collapse at a at certain point. You're just going to trash yourself to death, you know? But the younger generations worldwide are realizing it, and they're not having it anymore. They're not having it. So all of these brands best wake up ASAP, smell the coffee, because guess what, boo? The shit hit the fan already a couple of years ago. It did. It did. And what are they going to do? What are they going to do? They can't just keep hoping and wishing that China is going to keep being gullible and buying everything that they churn out with the logo on it. China is very intelligent. They're going to realize at a certain point that they're, that they're being made fun of that these logo-driven, overly hyped, expensive luxury products are not good quality anymore because these brands have just become super lazy. They just think that they can just sell the logo for a lot of money but maximize profits by having minimal to no quality left. People are realizing that, uh, no, they're waking up. They don't want that anymore. So these brands are going to be in a hell of a pickle pretty soon when their sales drop drastically and they will mark my words they will and it's going to be a, a big issue never forget to never give up on love see you next saturday you spooky little ghouls we're going to spend some more time together as we count down to halloween next saturday live stream will begin 3 p.m la time 6 p.m new york time midnight eu time 11 p.m uk 10 so you guys i love you all so much thank you so much for bearing with me throughout this long wake as we count down to Halloween. Let's see what the look is going to be next week and what the topics are going to be. Uh, Chucky and Tiffany would also like to say uh, goodbye. Still here. I'm going to poke you in the eye again. Okay, girl. I'll be back. I always come back. Actually, he said it best. I'll be back. I always come back. See you soon, guys. Have a wonderful day, night, morning, evening, wherever in the world you are. Until next week, never forget to never give up on love. Love you all. See you soon. Take care. Bye.